You are watching the Big Dog Post Game Show, brought to you by Viner Forgates and the Big Dog himself, Rick Jacklich at the Jacklich Law Group. Good afternoon from the Viner Forgates Studio. This is the Big Dog Post Post Game Show. Win it in overtime, double overtime, 12-11. I'm Wayne Viner. That's Bruce Posner. Bruce, you've seen a lot of these, probably more than anybody else I know, a lot of season openers. What'd you make of today's game? You know, I was told it was going to be a tough game for Maryland. I mean, they were a heavy favorite in this game, but I was said to ignore it because Richmond had so many guys returning except their face-off guy and their goalie. And I thought, well, you know, that should make it go Maryland's way. But uh, Luke Werman still won the face-off battle. He was 17-12. and 12, But uh, early on in the game, he did not. He was behind the first period. They converted. They had some good goals. Maybe Logan McNally was a little rusty. I don't know. I have to ask Mason about that. But Maryland came back, and they just could not put the team away. And it got to the point where they're lucky they won. I mean, it could have gone either way. Great defense, though, at the end of the game and in the first overtime to prevent uh, Richmond from scoring. But Owen Murphy, who, who did virtually nothing the entire game, came up big when it mattered. I mean, it was a great goal. Your guy, your buddy, your tailgate buddy. And uh, I'm happy for him. I'm, I'm happy for all of them. I was there four years ago. They opened the season. The Terps did with an overtime win. Maryland got down five too early. They climbed back in, as you said, and several times had a two-goal two lead. And you start to think, there we go. And Richmond just snipes back. I, I loved how hard they played. The Richmond Spiders had a lot to be happy about today, but the name of the game is to win it. And yes, when Maryland needed it, especially into that overtime, you saw Zapatello start to hit like the Maryland Terrapins. I didn't think Maryland was that physical for most of the game, but they played real Maryland lacrosse when it got to overtime. You know, you're up 10 to 8. I think they had three two-goal leads and could not hold them. And usually when that happens and the other team, but, you know, Richmond never got on top. And it's the old story like we talk about in basketball. You got to get on top. They didn't do it. Uh, You know, just at the end of the first overtime, I mean, Maltz Maltz looked like he had a snowbird, but he just couldn't get it done. Uh, He had he was two for nine. He had nine shots. All right. I was going to bring uh, that up. He missed a yeah. couple. Owen Murphy had the one that hit the crossbar. And for the first time ever, Maryland throws the challenge flag. So, so many times Maryland came close to, as you said, put it away. And it, it, they just couldn't do it. No. Uh, Maliver took a while to get into it. He did score one. Spanos missed a goal that he wouldn't miss in five years. Face on to the goalie. He was running toward him. He just missed the net. Braden Nurkse had three goals, a couple, one, I think one hit the pipe. Chorus was, uh, had one a little quiet. Ryan Syracuse, who I think had the assist on the winner. Did he have the assist? I'm pretty sure. Hey, let me ask you this much. Tillman brings in the second line for the second overtime. Did that shock you? He needed, somebody needed to step up. What, what did uh, shock or bother? Of course, we knew this going into the season. There isn't a guy to give the ball to and get out of the way. We talked about it as we looked at the season. You see it in the first game. They're, they're missing the offensive hammer. So the strongest well, unit. Erickson is kind of there. I mean, he, he did get three goals, but uh, they just they were so rusty today. I mean, the turnovers, I think they had 17, was it? Uh, 17 turnovers. And two of them in the overtime. And I tell you what, some of their clears. Now, I I don't know how they were. They had 22 for 25. They blew some clears in the third and fourth quarter. Fourth quarter and overtime that were unbelievable. Just like you just threw the ball forward, hoping they would get it. But uh, Wayne, at the end of the day, they're 1-0. and I mean, it counts as much as if they won by 10. But what about the upsets around the horn this year? This Today, rather. Hopkins losing to Denver at home. The vaulted Johns Hopkins Blue Jays. I mean, had come it. on. They, they had it, and Denver comes back. and They had a 
player whose name escapes me, I think it was uh, Spilstra, had six of the 13 goals for Denver. He was amazing, and they win in overtime. Penn State has Colgate in Happy Valley. Not so Happy Valley today. They lose with four seconds left. Stunned by Colgate. Yeah, there's some upsets already. Well, I don't think Colgate's ranked. I mean, at least Richmond was ranked. Richmond didn't catch us by surprise. Tillman knew this team was good. They mm-hmm. virtually brought back everybody. They had the uh, offensive player of the year from last year. That was Dalton Young. They had the uh, the rookie mid the rookie of the year uh, playing, and they had Aiden O'Neill. Okay, also a tremendous guy who came back. So they were loaded. Uh, scoring wise, and you saw that early on. Now, how about McNanny? What was your take on him as the father of a goalie? Yeah, I didn't focus specifically on him. He was fine later in the game. He was much better, and when they really needed him, he was there. He he didn't play maybe as athletically as he did before he got hurt, but that's fine. Um, and he has a great defense to rely on and they add these grad ta- transfers like Nick Alvitti, uh played a bit as a long stick midi. Uh, they had, what's his name? Jackson Canfield comes in, played a lot. He split some yeah, time. He played local. Shallow. He played, I think he played well. I, you know, I was, I was more into the game than I really was as to who was playing well or not, but let's go through the Terps. Well, and well, analyze. Before we move on, there's one more yeah. of those transfers came in and, Played a good deal as a as a short stick midi. Colin Sharkey came in, so you, a lot of guys played, but these transfers did sort of pop off the page. Maryland picked up a lot of experience. They got Jake McDonald, who was there, fifty ones played a lot. There's a lot of experience on defense. Just it, I said right now, defense is ahead of offense. I'll have you go over the offense. Well, let's start off. Let's start off with a guy who plays defense, but was big on offense, and that was number one. And he played like number one today. Anyway, he had he a goal. He had yeah. a true goal, and then uh, a couple times toward the end of the game, he made that play at, at uh, half at uh, midfield to knock a guy out, and for us to get the ball back at the end of the first overtime. So he played like number one. So for me, he's the player of the game. All right, I thought that uh, it's really hard to pinpoint anybody offensively. Maybe Irksa or maybe Kel, uh, maybe Murphy because he scored. But I will say this. Everybody participated in the offense, right? Nobody, I mean, Daniel Kelly had a goal and assist. Uh, Owen Murphy had the goal. Uh, Maliver had a goal and assist. Spanos had a goal. Uh, Irksa, three. Chorus, one. I mean, Course had two assists too, so we got to give him credit for that. Even Jack Brennan had an assist. So all these guys are rotating in and out, but somewhere along the line, they got to find something they're happy with. Because I know he, Danny Kelly, played attack, first midfield, and second midfield today. Hmm. I mean, he was rotating them everywhere. Maybe he uses the, him in that way. This is how even this game was, Wayne. I'm looking at the stats. Uh, Maryland, 27 to 26 on ground balls. All right. Uh, face off 17 to 12. That's probably why the Terps won. Clears, they, uh, Richmond was perfect. Maryland was 22 for 25. Uh, turnover, 17 to 16. Ground balls, I looked before. Oh, there it is, 27, 26. Shots, 36 to 36. It was a dead even game. Any way you want to look at it. It seemed to me that Maryland had better shots. So they had more opportunities to score, but they couldn't make it happen. The goalie, I wonder what the saves were. The saves were 13 to 10 for McNanny. And uh, after the first period, I thought he was great. He only gave up six goals the rest of the way. And, uh, you know, had quite a few saves to stop that. But, hey, it's a W. We move on to Loyola. Who upset? Georgetown today. And Wayne, what do I tell you? Georgetown went there last year. My good friend Kevin Warren never took the foot off the gas pedal. He wins 25 to 6 or something. Never took it off. And what happened today, Wayne? All right. 
Loyola blows them out, 18 to 10. A little bit of revenge. Look, Maryland has uh, revenge on their mind for this Loyola game. We went there last year. Maryland loses. It, it should be the type of game that you hope you play, which is a, somebody that you know, a bit of a rivalry. This one's at Maryland. Looking forward to it. And they want to know. You say you're, we're not sure if we're happy, but a win is a win, and you move on. And boy, this road ahead looks even tougher as the as the day goes on. How many really good teams there are in D1 lacrosse? Wayne, you make a good point, and here's the one thing about being one and zero. Okay, you only play 12 games. All right, this is not like an elongated season, like basketball or the Big Ten conference with 20 games. You can afford a loss or an upset or whatever, but in this thing, I, I'm not saying a loss to Richmond would end the season because it would not have, but it wouldn't have been a good start, okay? It would not have been a good start. And really, with the kind of schedule they have with Syracuse and Princeton and Virginia and Notre Dame and then the conference, there's, there is no easy game, and it proved today, today was not an easy game. It just had reminiscences. It, re, it reminded me of last year against Army. It was like the offense just couldn't get started. And Tillman and Mike Phipps have a lot, to, a lot to do, a lot of work to do. The defense, I thought, was fine. It'll work itself out. But, uh, hey, Wayne, 1-0, baby. That's all that matters, right? 1-0 today. And now Maryland has a basketball doubleheader tonight. The women have Iowa in College Park. The men are at Michigan State. So we'll have more to talk about as as the weekend rolls on. And a shout out to the new associate athletic director at LaSalle. LaSalle host. Who might that be? Who might that be? That is one Jordan Viner, a proud Terp Talk uh, intern alumnus. He moves from Temple in Philadelphia over to LaSalle. And he is now the men's basketball SID as well for Fran Dumphy, a Philly legend. And, well, they, they had the lead on St. Joe's. LaSalle could not hold on, but kudos to Jordan. And I think that might do it for this uh, post game for the Richmond lacrosse season opener. Terps, a double overtime winner, 12 to 11. I want to say one thing before you go. Jordan, what a great kid. And for him to ascend to that kind of role at the age of 25 Wayne, you know it's impossible, all right? It's impossible to get that kind of role at a major university at the age of 25. I mean, give credit to the kid for uh, how hard he works and how well he is on the on the media, social media and everything he does and his relationships with every coach he's come across. So I say to you, congratulations. You should be very, very proud uh, he was on national TV today as he uh, first of many appearances. Yes, yes, he was. That is, God, that's great to see. It is it's just fantastic. That'll do it for the post game show. Uh, we will see you later in the weekend and talk about Maryland, Michigan State. It'll probably be tomorrow, which is Sunday. Good afternoon from the Viner Four Gate Studios. We'll see you soon. Go Terps.